Assalamu alaikum. I was really hoping that uh, I wouldn't be the first one to speak English this morning, but I guess it was written that way. Um, but anyway, my uh, colleague uh, Hashtrudi Zad was next to me translating and uh, assisted me in learning, I think, some of the Farsi this morning. Uh, some words are complicated, like uh, intranet and uh, informatic and merci and uh, Mohandas e-computer. So, and so, inast anchiyat gereftan. Thank you. It's really an honor and a great pleasure to be with you today uh, during this uh, reunion of the Sharif University of Technology. Um, and I'm also grateful for the invitation and uh, also very happy to hear that uh, some of our colleagues from Iran are with us here uh, today. Um, anyway, so today I thought that I can maybe share with you uh, some uh, thoughts concerning um, technology and um, education and learning. So uh, I think the main points that I'd like to focus on would be the uh, technology-enabled education and some of its implications, uh, some principles of uh, pedagogy, and some examples of a new uh, pedagogy. Uh, in the slide here you see uh, a couple of uh, textbooks that have been written on, on the subject, and I'm sure there are uh, other ones. Um, when we look at technology-enabled education uh, and distance learning, uh, in fact, we think of distance education as a subset of technology-enabled education because the technology that is used uh, can be used not only for distance education but also for what you might call the uh, conventional uh, education. And it has been effective and had many successes. Um, some of them are listed here in the slide, University of Maine, for example, Penn State, Stanford, and others. And this poses, I think, a new educational uh, paradigm in terms of the, let's say, course delivery, in terms of using the web as a tool for education, either offline, offline and online, we're also using web materials as part of uh, a course in conjunction with class and laboratory uh, activities. And also it pushes us into thinking or in a different way about teaching and learning. So today, we do not speak about students but maybe with on learners. And we're not teachers but we are maybe mentors and coaches. Teaching is learning. Passive learning is active learning, where we try to engage, let, let's say, the students or the learners uh, more. Instead of teaching material, we look at accomplishing a goal, setting a goal and trying to accomplish it. We talk about synchronous versus asynchronous uh, presentations or delivery of material. And also, in terms of the classroom teaching, we talk also about distance uh, uh, teaching. And I think the distance education and also the tools and technology that are used uh, for that I think are important not only for countries like the United States, Canada and so on, but also for our countries like Iran. I'm originally from uh, Algeria and I think we have uh, uh, similar perhaps issues uh, that way. And the other thing about education is something important in terms of looking at the students or the learners in this case and uh, how much they have learned or retained or remembered. And in this case, if we just read, most people would retain just about 10% of what they read, either on paper or maybe on a screen of a computer. And if you hear, then you would maybe maintain or retain about 20% of that. Okay? And then if you see, would be about 30%. And if you see and hear, about 60%. Okay? And so now, if you discuss with others, then it goes up to about 70%. And 
and if you experience it yourself, let's say doing something, all right, then the amount of information that is retained will be about 80%. Okay? And of course, the best way of retaining information is to teach uh, others. And so in our curriculum, for example, at MIT, we have been using some of these uh, uh, results, let's say, that people that specialize in pedagogy and so on have um, uh, uh, came up with and introducing these kinds of uh, tools uh, or procedures in the courses that way. All right. Um, another point that we'll look at is some kind of matching between the pedagogy, the technology, and also the content and the learners. Okay. So in this slide, you will see on the left-hand side, let's say, the uh, knowledge of a domain, let's say. And then on the right-hand side, let's say, starting from kindergarten into high school, into college, and then into post-graduation. And then in between the two, there has to be some kind of, let's say, technology to be used, and perhaps pedagogy that goes with it as well. And so we think about, let's say, the technology that is being used. Okay. Of course, the obvious ones are the, the internet, CD-ROMs, DVDs, and so on. Okay. And I think the important thing in terms of the pedagogy, we look at maybe different ways. Okay. The conventional way is to have the teacher or the professor or so using maybe 80% of the time in delivering information uh, to students and learners. Okay. But now you would like to inverse that, to reverse it in a sense where the students are acting and active, let's say, 80% of the time of the lecture and then the, uh, let's say, the, the coach or the assistant or the faculty member is coaching on the side and guiding uh, the, the, the students and the learners. And then comes the content and also the design of these, um, uh, let's say, courses um, uh, for educational uh, offerings. Okay? And I think, I know that we're running out of time, so I'll try to be brief uh, on these uh, issues. So the first thing is to focus on the learner or the person that is uh, uh, learning uh, in terms of the methods and the tools that will maybe affect the behavior of the learner so that it, he, he or she can respond in an appropriate way and learn uh, better. And also to remember that the technology is just a tool and we shouldn't make it the focus uh, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the experience. Uh, and so in this case, uh, for example, um, uh, we would look into uh, which technology, let's say, to use so that the learner or the student uh, responds in a better way. Other important issues, of course, revolve around uh, training the instructors maybe in some uh, continuous way. For example, uh, at MIT we have, let's say, some meetings about people that specialize in pedagogy uh, as an example. Another example would be uh, that we have where the faculty member is filmed uh, during the lecture, the entire lecture, whether it's an hour or an hour and a half, and then that lecture is studied by some people, and then later on the same faculty member will sit with these expert, if you want to call them, in the pedagogy, and then we'll try to show or indicate the errors that were done, let's say, during the delivery of certain material and, and interacting with the students and so on. The other thing is the uh, attention, okay, in terms of designing the courses, the people that are listening in general have a limited attention span, and so if the lecture is very long, then after a certain time, people can lose um, their attention and, and focus. And the other thing is, in terms of the knowledge that is uh, delivered, uh, has to be some kind of limited. I don't think we would want people, let's say, walking around with, let's say, an encyclopedia in their head. I think that we have to be selective in terms of the material that we are um, uh, presenting. And also, the process of um, information absorption is important in terms of delivering the information, the rate at which the information is delivered, and also the amount of information that is delivered. 
and also the form of the presentation of that material. Now, when we talk about absorption, which is not memorization, okay, so that means we need to get to a level where the person who is acquiring the information gets it with understanding and then in a form that will make it easy for that person to use and also easy for that person to rapidly access it. Okay? So, so these are things that uh, we, we should be, I think, considering in the development of these um, courses, not only for distance education, but for any type of material that we are presenting. Another important issue is this um, problem-solving skills. Okay? Um, I think it has to be emphasized because um, if I take the example, let's say, of, of engineering, uh, an engineer, I think, would be useful uh, if that engineer can solve not only theoretical problems, but also real, practical uh, problems. And so in the ed education aspect, we'd like to look at how to bring about these kind of um, uh, features and, and uh, characteristics, let's say, from uh, the learners. And so uh, in the, uh, I will speak maybe a little bit later about how to introduce maybe case studies uh, in, the, in the teaching material. Um, another thing is passive versus active uh, teaching. As I mentioned before, uh, most of the uh, lectures that um, uh, I think people give would be the same that I'm giving now, okay? It's a one-way uh, presentation, okay? So that means the learners or the students are acting as receptors. And as I said, we would like to reverse that one in terms of having the participation of the learners uh, uh, greater than before. Um, and, um, and let me now maybe show you some examples of these things that are happening at, uh, at MIT. Um, one of the courses is in electromagnetism, okay? And this is by uh, Professor John uh, Belchers in the physics department. And so in this course, there are no lectures. So the students will study using web materials on the side, all right, and they learn on their own, and then they go to the studio that has been prepared um, appropriately, and the students do the practice in that studio, practical uh, uh, aspect of this, okay? And there is a student collaboration between them, so that will bring about these issues that we mentioned earlier about discussing among others and then practicing and so on. Uh, I mean, some of these, uh, as I think the bottom left-hand side uh, of the slide indicates the, it took about maybe a year to two years to develop not only the material, but also building this um, uh, the studio, and also it took maybe $2 million or so uh, to put it together. Okay, this, is, this includes the renovation of the space and so on. Okay, uh, another type, uh, this is uh, 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 virtual labs that are being used, uh, for example, in the uh, uh, MIT Singapore program that we have. Um, as part of the curriculum, students that are in Singapore, um, coming from uh, India, China, uh, Taiwan, from basically the whole region, uh, are taking courses in, from Singapore and linking to MIT. The courses are taught by MIT faculty. And then the labs that they do, they connect by internet, as you see in the slide here, to equipment that is already at MIT. And then they do the, their experiments that way. All right. Uh, this is another course, maybe I can just skip uh, another course in, um, uh, in physics at MIT. Uh, and the purpose of that one is to increase the face-to-face -face contact between the teacher uh, and the students. Um, and then I mentioned earlier about this practical aspect, which I think is very important. So in this course that I'm involved in, in the MIT Singapore uh, program, um, I use some of these examples. This one, for example, is a, um, is a case that looks at uh, a crack uh, propagation uh, in the skin of aircraft, for example. And then the, um, uh, in this case, uh, the question would be to look at designing a sensing methodology that would uh, look at how that crack is, uh, is propagating uh, as, a de as a design uh, case, okay? Uh, this is the maybe different shots of this, uh, of this machine. Uh, you can see, let me try to use this. Uh, for example, here there is a vision system. The cracks are initiated 
let's say, on the skin, right? And then you can see all this hydraulics uh, on the side here that will take that skin and then put pressure on it to simulate, let's say, a flight uh, conditions. Um, this is another example, let's say, for uh, designing an automatic system for cleaning uh, nuclear reactors, for example. Okay? And so when you do a study like this one, it brings about not only the automation, but also something about uh, what happens in nuclear reactors and, uh, and so on. And, um, and so, uh, so in this uh, uh, thought that I wanted to share with you, that there is this t technology. I think the technology in terms of hardware and software and so on exists. The important thing is that how to design the content of the courses and how to use this technology to deliver the courses in, in an appro appropriate way. And then this thing is moving, as you can see in this train, okay, and then we have no choice actually but to ride on that train and, and go along. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I wish you a successful uh, conference and an enjoyable reunion. And with the Thank you. Thank you.